These are the voyages of the starship Enterprise. By the mid-80s, Gene Roddenberry's original wagon train to the stars was still rumbling along on syndicated TV. The ratings are actually better. And people are watching this show now for the third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh time. Star Trek was no longer simply a canceled TV show on loop. Three lucrative movies had transformed the franchise into a blockbuster. Star Trek 2, 3, and 4 are just really great movies. But when it came to this wagon train, Gene had already fallen off. He had been screwed over. He wasn't getting any ownership money. Paramount was rejecting his scripts. They saw him as the enemy. Relegated to the sidelines, Gene could only join the growing audience and watch as Star Trek took off without him. So beam aboard and hold on tight as we boldly go into the depths of Star Trek. And you can see it all from here in the center seat. Take us home. 1986, Voyage Home is a huge hit. Everybody remember where we parked. Star Trek was heating up. Star Trek is the most profitable property that Paramount has. It may have been profitable, but Paramount wasn't admitting it, at least not to Gene. Gene Roddenberry owned 20% of Star Trek, and Shatter owned 5%. Which sounds like more than a little... But in fact... Neither of them had gotten a penny. Paramount's excuse? Star Trek was penniless. Paramount said it's in the red. <laughs> it's the most successful show in reruns. It's now out on home video. It's, it's in the red. Gene knew Star Trek was a gold mine. And if he needed any confirmation, it came to him one day on the golf course. Gene was golfing one day with one of the studio lawyers. And the lawyer said, let's make the next hole interesting. Gene says, I tell you what, let's make it really interesting. How about my royalties on Star Trek? <laughs> and they both laugh. And Gene says, what do you think those royalties would really be worth? And the lawyer looks one way and looks the other way. Says about, probably about 30 million. And more was to come because Paramount wanted to bring Star Trek back to the small screen with a new show. The stations were pushing to bring it back. And we had tried to relaunch it in 81, 82, 83, but it never really happened. So for the next few years, they're going back and forth. We want to bring Star Trek back. The next generation of Star Trek was going to require the next generation of executives. My name is Lucy Salhaney. Lucy and her colleagues had an idea that had never been tried before. Let us syndicate. Selling a brand new Star Trek straight into syndication. That means selling a show station by station. We will sell the original 79, and we will sell them the new Star Trek. Local stations got their new Star Trek, and Paramount kept a share of advertising. So we'll have this foundation of money from the original TV show, and the advertising revenue from the new Star Trek, and that's how we paid for the show. Incredible. A new television business model would enable the next generation of Star Trek. Star Trek broke the mold again. But what would they call this next generation? We just kept talking about this next generation. I don't even know how it came up, but that's how we named the show. It was Star Trek, colon, the next generation. The colon never made it to screen, but Star Trek, the next generation was heading back into space. We believed in Star Trek. We believed it was the time. We believed space was going to be an important part of what people were thinking and talking about. And we believed in Gene Roddenberry. But Gene no longer believed in Paramount. So when it came to agreeing for a new show, before signing up, Gene lawyered up. He realized that Paramount needed Star Trek and he needed a strong lawyer. Gene's lawyer was a lot more than just strong. Gene's lawyer was, to put it politely, one of the most despicable, detestable, vile human beings I've ever, ever had to deal with in any way. But there was one very notable thing about Gene's lawyer. He knew how to work a deal. Gene and his lawyer, Leonard Maislich, had negotiated a deal. Not just any deal. He wrote a contract that said Roddenberry would get a percentage of the ownership, that he would get paid by specific dates, and that he would get to inspect the books. What are we going to call this new series, Gene? Uh, oh, just put down Star Trek. 
So Leonard writes the contract, the president of Paramount signs it and everything else. You know, he says, congratulations, good to have you back in the family. Gene says, by the way, I'm gonna have my accountant call next week to look at the books. Says, Excuse me? He says, no, really. We're gonna audit Star Trek. No, Gene, there aren't any books. We haven't started doing the show yet. And Gene says, look at my contract. You just gave me the right. The new contract has auditing rights. Leonard Mazelish didn't put Star Trek The Next Generation. He put Star Trek, and they signed it. So Gene now had the right to inspect the books from the original Star Trek. Paramount knew all too well the story those books could tell. And suddenly, instead of a penniless Star Trek, it was pennies from heaven for Gene. We'll give you a million dollar payout right now. Rolls Royce was delivered to his office at Paramount. He hands him the keys, a brand new Rolls Royce, hands him a check. A bonus for signing with Star Trek, and then we'll pay you an enormous amount of money each week. That's what Leonard Mazes was able to do for Gene Roddenberry. So, thanks to Gene's lawyer... He's getting an enormous amount of money. I don't know how much, but it was a lot. And as a result, Gene Roddenberry was always indebted to Leonard Mazes and gave him a lot of power. But since Leonard the lawyer had no power over creative matters, and with Gene a bit under the weather... He was having health issues. His best years were behind him. And so he asked his two most trusted writers from the original series for help. We asked Dorothy and he asked David Gerald to prepare the Bible. This was the perfect opportunity to reimagine Star Trek. Oh, great. We can fix the star dates. We can fix the warp speed. We can fix all of the stuff that was inconsistent. A manifest. Yes, sir. If he was going to write the show Bible, David was going to write a New Testament. Let's have an older, more thoughtful captain who doesn't beam down and put himself in danger. The away team's ready, sir. Energize. Gene says, oh, I like that. And Gene says, well, we need a Spock character. That is wise. Well, we can't have a Vulcan. I am an android, though anatomically I am a male. <laughs> Let's do the opposite. I seem to have reached an odd functional impasse. Let's have an android who wants to learn how to be human. Intriguing. I just, you know, took a shot and did my best. And happy to have a job. Some of David's ideas were truly radical. And I said, we could have a Klingon on the bridge. <laughs> Gene said no. Impossible. But Gene was clinging on to the past. Dorothy came along later. She said, let's have a Klingon on the crew. Gene said no. So Gene had doubled down on no Klingons. But he did want original series writing legend D.C. Fontana's way with words. He asked me, would I please write the pilot script? Uh, encounter at Farpoint, and I said, fine. This Farpoint station will be an excellent test. We were telling people, don't suggest putting a Klingon on the ship. Gene says no. When we get to encounter at Farpoint, and Dorothy writes it where Tasha Yar is in command. Yar here. And Gene rewrites it and introduces the character of Worf. I am Lieutenant Worf. So he won't have to have a woman in the command chair. And suddenly, David and Fontana had their Klingon on the bridge. But Jean had burned a bridge in the process. She added to my pilot script. And that was the first thing that was a little disappointing. I see. I see. He added all the stuff that had to do with Q. Call ourselves the Q. Jean took her script, and he adds the character of Q, who is now testing the Enterprise. Gene only had one story. We meet God, and we beat the crap out of him. The same old story all over again. Gene had a long history of playing God with the scripts. Which I didn't particularly care for, but it's not my choice. This time, Gene was not just rewriting the script. He was rewriting the deal. I had to share that script credit with him. He said, the studio wants my name on it, and this is Leonard Mazelish's doing. Dorothy was furious. Gene had lied to her, and he now was getting half the credit and half the money on this script. Having been pushed aside on her own pilot, Gene threw Fontana a small but lucrative bone. And this is where it gets really ugly. She could write the story as she saw fit, but not for TV, for a book. Publishing was going to give $30,000 for the novelization. Dorothy promptly wrote the novelization of her own episode. And Dorothy had written the novelization. She was done with it. But no matter how evil her own villain in the book, it was nothing compared to what Leonard the lawyer had planned. She's going to turn it in, and Leonard Mazler says, we're taking the novelization away from you. And he comes to me and says, would you like to do the novelization of Encounter at Farpoint? So I said, yeah, I, I can do that. But Leonard Mazelish was about to hit a roadblock made of solid loyalty. 
and its name was David Gerald. And then I go to Dorothy very privately. I said, I know you finished the book, and I know what Leonard has done. Give me your book, I'll turn it in and give you the money. I would do anything for Dorothy Fontana, and you know, if Leonard is gonna screw her, he has to go through me. 18 Earth years since its last primetime adventure, Star Trek was finally launching a new mission. Gene Roddenberry wanted to make a Star Trek that was different from what he had done in the 60s. We'll break us out of orbit and continue to our next assignment. But this next generation Star Trek posed a next level challenge. We must proceed in our own way. How to reshape the franchise for a new generation without losing touch with Star Trek's roots. Every Star Trek begins with how do we make it exactly like the others except totally different. Gene was very proud of what he had done on the original series, but he wasn't afraid to shake things up. Everything was up for renegotiation. The set design, the costumes, the makeup, the hair design, everything had to be created new and invented. Including a new and redesigned enterprise. It seemed like everything was new. Gene had a very definite directive to me. No pistols. These phases have been retuned. Which led to a few new questions. How do you hold an energy weapon if it's not like a gun? Well, then it's like a flashlight. Hold it right there. I think the first time I pulled out my phaser, I went, you know, like I made a noise. Ships and guns were one thing, but what about the people to control them? Star Trek had to find a new leader, and that person had some big boots to fill. You're from outer space. No, I'm from Iowa. I only work in outer space. Gene wanted to have everything be not original series. And so what's the totally opposite you can be of an Iowa farm boy is a French guy. I'm Captain Jean-Luc Picard of the USS Enterprise. But it's a long way from Iowa to Paris. Well, we were used to Shantner. The expectation is you're going to get somebody like him. A far bigger problem was who should play this aristocratic Frenchman? What the devil am I doing here? How many French actors are we going to read? The answer was obvious. Oh, great. An Englishman, of course. When they came up <laughs> with it, we went, oh, my god. Gene Roddenberry was unconvinced. Gene didn't want uh, Patrick Stewart. He felt there was something missing about Patrick Stewart. Gene didn't like the fact that he was hairless. Gene wanted it to be somebody who looked like Jeffrey Hunter or William Shatner, that standard American lean man. Gene felt Star Trek would be losing touch with its roots if it cast a captain that didn't have any, but he was abundant with something else. He had a gravitas. All right! Gene was so impressed by his acting, he said, okay. But if Gene loved Patrick's smooth acting, he still wasn't a fan of his smooth head. Damn. This bald guy shows up looking for the hair department with his very proper English accent. He says, hi, I'm Patrick Stewart. And he has this box. In the box wear wigs for a hair test because Gene Roddenberry, he was not about to have a bald captain. Who's to say whether Patrick Stewart passed or failed the hair test? It was a little bit of a shocker. But then someone had a bright idea. Why not let him just be what he is? It won't be compared to the original Star Trek. As simple as that. Of course. What Patrick Stewart lacked was not a problem, it was the solution. If they try to get somebody like Shantner, it's gonna kill the show. We need somebody different that people will talk about. Patrick Stewart's skull was the least of Star Trek's casting problems. Creating that ensemble, it's a bitch. 85% of the success of your show is your casting. But not to worry, because... Gene had a superpower, and it was casting. He would go with his gut feeling he will triumph who knows when to fight. With the men, he looked for people who were capable of heroic deeds. And for the women. Jean was always looking for women who had a certain presence. And you can see it with Marina Surtees and Gates McFadden. Their presence is compelling. Dr. Crusher. Captain. As for my presence, yes, that's me. I almost wasn't even present at my audition. I had come out to L.A. for something else, and I was on my way back to the airport when my agent said, please go to Paramount and audition. Well, what's the part? She said, oh, just go, just go. I went there, and they said, yeah, any of the women's roles. Doctor, all I've got is... Is an order to report to sickbay from the only person aboard this ship who can give you an order. I thought it was a big step forward for women in command positions. The fact that she was a mother and had to deal with her child on the ship. Mom, could you get me a look at the bridge? 
All of those things were why I ultimately said yes. Mr. Crusher? Star Trek's first single mom would bring with her Star Trek's first series regular teenager. I'm with Starfleet. Gene really wanted a character that kids could relate to. Breathe. Gotta remember to breathe. I was a super weird kid. I was shy. And I just felt so seen by Star Trek. So when I had an opportunity to become part of Star Trek, I was so nervous that I went in there and I just sucked. I wasn't prepared at all. I just blew it and I left and I was like, well, I just lost that job. You judge your condition good. I judge it excellent, sir. Denise Crosby entered through the back door thanks to a last minute brainstorm. Originally, I was reading for the part of Counselor Troy. I came in and read for Rick Berman and Gene Roddenberry, and Gene said, would you mind reading the part of Tasha Yar? Security chief, I can't just stand here and let Yes, you can, Lieutenant Yar. And Gene said, I see it suddenly differently. Wesley? I haven't stepped one foot on your bridge, Captain. And for Will Wheaton, the door didn't shut. Casting had called and said, he just wasn't what we know he can be. We just want him to come back and take another swing at it. Sit down over there, young man. I went back and I didn't suck. That never happens. I'm really lucky and really grateful. Generosity has always been my weakness. John Delancey's casting as Q came from the unlikely combination of daytime TV, heart surgery, and a lawyer pretending to be someone else. A guy walks out. He said, I'm one of the producers. He actually wasn't. He was Gene's lawyer. Leonard the lawyer was back as a producer. And he said, this is a payback. Four or five years ago, I was flat on my back with a quadruple bypass operation. Every day, I would watch you. I had been on a uh, soap opera. You should have seen the smile on her face. And you made me laugh when I thought I was going to die. Leonard Maislish brought me in. And I was there at 6 o'clock in the morning on Monday. Another brilliant suggestion. The question for the producers was, how would all of this play in the kingdom of fandom? There was an actual protest about the next generation. You're never going to replace Kirk and Spock. You can't wipe away Kirk and Spock and McCoy for us. You know, the fans, they just thought we were killing the sacred cow. Leonard Nimoy said that, you know, how many times could you create lightning in a bottle? It is possible, but absolutely no margin for error. Lightning or not, things did get a little rattled come opening night. When the show aired, when I saw that crane shot, and it came in like this, <laughs> I went, oh dear, <laughs> this show isn't gonna go anywhere. The first episode, Encounter at Farpoint, went shakily into the unknown on September 28th, 1987. Encounter at Farpoint to me is a strange hybrid. It's way too long. It's a two hour and it's really only got enough story for an hour. It's kind of undisciplined and loose limbed. It kind of flops around a bit. I don't see no points on your ears, boy, but you sound like a Vulcan. But something about this loose limbed, ill disciplined behemoth struck a chord. The early returns were phenomenal, far beyond what anybody thought they would be. And we knew we had a major hit on our hands. A feeling of great joy. It sure was. And gratitude. Despite a shaky debut, Star Trek The Next Generation was an instant hit. I feel strange, but also good. This brand new chapter was a breath of fresh air for Gene Roddenberry's aging franchise. Hello, stranger. But then the air went stale. The third episode was the one, I think, where, as a viewer, I stopped watching. The dreaded Code of Honor. Episode three arrived with a storyline so loaded, it looked like unexploded ordinance from another time. We go to the old black planet, and I've got to fight the woman. <laughs> He's going to take the white woman as his new wife. We were like, are we really doing this? Yep, they did. Star Trek f***ed up in a really, really, really bad way. There is no doubt in my mind that the cast would have pushed back if it was later in the run. Some of the people who could have made a difference would have just refused to go to work. It's the same kind of pompous, strutting charades that endangered our own species a few centuries ago. I was scratching my head thinking there's no way this is going to get on the air. There's no way. If they had not had a guarantee of two seasons, this show would not have gotten 
past the first season. I am programmed in multiple techniques, a broad variety of pleasuring. That first season was all over the map. <laughs> the show is trying to figure out what it is on a very basic level. How close to the original series should we be and how different should we be? It's almost just like they're throwing things at the wall and seeing what'll stick. Coordinates set in, Captain. Speed, walk five. For the actors, the only thing more uncomfortable than the storylines were the costumes. Nice suit. Thank you. <laughs> there are some costume choices where I go, oh my god, it's just terrible. Splendid, splendid. We finished our ski lesson, sir. I hated Wesley's sweaters. I hated the colors. They were baggy, they were weird. Like, I just felt awkward. The gray space suit, wardrobe built a big muscle suit that I had to wear underneath. I hated that thing so much. It was so uncomfortable, it was always too tight. But some costumes were ill-fitting in ways wardrobe couldn't fix. What do you think? Gene brought Bill Tice, his original Star Trek designer. Bill Tice was a lovely man, but you look at his costumes, you think you're looking at the original series. These costumes hadn't really evolved. You should get into uniform. Even the standard issue was so problematic, it was affecting actors' performances. The tail was wagging the dog. The costumes for the permanent cast on The Next Generation were Lycra one-piece suits, and they wrecked havoc on the cast because they would pull on their body and force the actors into a hunched position. When you sit down in that spacesuit, the tunic rides up. Patrick started dramatically tucking it down, and they call it the Picard maneuver. Costume designer Bob Blackman came to the rescue in season two with a new two-piece number that saw Star Trek returning to its military themes. I looked at the Second World War and saw Dwight Eisenhower in his little jacket that was fashioned just for him. And I said, let me take that silhouette and work with that. And that's how we came up with the two-piecer. The cast was most grateful for that. Over in the writer's room, another generational battle was playing out and the disagreements were over more than style. Gene ran it in a very hodgepodge kind of way. People would bring him stories, he would give it then to everybody to get notes, and it was very odd. Even Stranger was who Gene brought in as script doctor. Leonard Mazelish, his attorney, was doing a lot of the writing. They didn't like Leonard Mazelish at all, and they didn't want him rewriting their scripts. Gene's lawyer had proved he knew how to write a contract, but when it came to scripts, he'd already lost the room. Everybody hated Mazelish, uh, except Gene Roddenberry. And Gene's lawyer slash producer slash writer was stepping on some very esteemed toes. As a story editor, I was not terribly well treated. Things went over my head that I could have had input in. Dorothy Fontana has written a lot of great scripts, and she should have been a producer. Dorothy wasn't the only high-ranking woman feeling overlooked. Is that an order, Doctor? Yes. I often felt very lost and very out of place. I thought I was captain of this starship. Of course you are, but I... Thank you for the confirmation, Doctor. Star Trek in that era, in the late 80s, early 90s, was a, was a boys' club. As for the girls' club, well, there wasn't one. It was never like the women just got together, because we never had a scene together. And if we did, it would always be something almost comical, like we would be hitting someone on the head with a pot. <laughs> The power struggle on set mirrored the turf war raging among the producers as Gene fought to retain control, that is to say, his lawyer did. The studio execs, every time they would tell Gene how much they liked my work, the lawyer would panic, oh my god, they're gonna fire Gene and put in David Gerald, and so Gene would end up bawling me out. Uh, the one I feel bad for is David Gerald because he never even got his name on the screen. I mean, he wrote the Bible, he came up with some of those characters, they asked me, do you want the credit or the money? I said, I'll take the money. Others chose to take the exit. I stayed for the first 13 episodes, and then I left. It was not a terribly happy experience. Gene should have hired me and Dorothy as producers, and instead his despicable lawyer brought in a lot of people who didn't know what Star Trek was at all. But in the end, David knew the rules better than Gene's lawyer. And so the writer turned lawyer. Leonard was doing producer-level work on the show when he wasn't qualified and this was a violation of Writers Guild rules. With this Star Trek villain vanquished, Star Trek The Next Generation continued its syndicated success. However, some members of the crew were on their last legs. 
I actually asked them, could you make a mock-up of my legs? And the reason for such a request. You're always on Patrick and these guys down here, so you just really see my legs up there. I can go home. Denise decided it was time for home after her request for better Tasha Yar stories was rebuffed. Gene, he was the one who really said to me, the stories are going to focus on the captain, the first officer, and Data. It's, you know, that Shatner, Spock, Bones. When in Rome, we'll do as the Romans do. It's a formula that works, and I'm going to stick with that. So Gene made firm plans to dispense with Tasha Yar. He said, I want this character to be killed. I've never done it. And he said, the only problem is you won't be able to come back. I would. He said, yeah, go for it. And so finally, Tasha Yar got to be the center of attention. As she lay dying. What's Lieutenant Yar's condition? You know, it was such an anticlimactic, you know, death. Dr. Crusher, report. She's dead. That, by the way, was just making my character look like an unlicensed doctor. There were so many people who died on my table. <sighs> Damn. I remember Patrick saying, don't let her touch you. Her patients die. <laughs> How's your patient, doctor? Not good. It's a running joke, you know? It's like, I don't know about Crusher, how good she was. You are here now watching this image of me because I've died. But Tasha Yar's final moments would not be Denise's final moments on set. So Symbiosis was the last script that I shot, and obviously they reversed them. For that, she prepared an Easter egg and laid it right on camera. I waved goodbye in the camera. I'm waving goodbye to the fans. The fans and everyone, there she is. But Denise wasn't alone in wanting more for her character. Hey, Mom, look what I can do. I thought we were going to have some really great development between Wesley Crusher and Dr. Crusher because she was a scientist, he was this genius. you never seen that interested in warp theory before. It always broke my heart that we didn't get to have those scenes. Second season head writer Maurice Hurley wanted more action too, but not for his female characters. What do you want? He wanted the big adventure, the big conflict. Not so much interested in human dynamics, characterization, that kind of thing. Race Hurley, you know, that old school cigar chomping TV writer. The bottom line is uh, he was very sexist. He wrote women in lazy, tropey ways. I argued a lot about it with Maurice Hurley, and I think I was not very diplomatic. You know, he just was not, uh, not happy with her. I think I really, really upset him. And I heard later that he said, either she goes or I go. You are excused, Doctor. And so it was Dr. Crusher who was put into the transporter to nowhere. He was a producer-writer, so obviously the actor could be easily replaced. Nobody was cool with it. I recall the cast being angry about it. So having killed the doctor, producers sent for the doctor. Doctor, doctor. This doctor. Dr. Catherine Pulaski. I just got the call and went in, talked to Jane, and he said, would you be interested in playing a doctor on The Next Generation? And I said, yes. Well, that was easy. I like to help. I only agreed to do it because I was doing a totally different character. I'm Dr. Jones. Different to the doctor she played way back when, when a female doctor on TV was something to get excited about. Of course, Dr. McCoy. Please, don't worry about me. And not just for Bones. I based my character on Bones. Well, what do you know? And a lot of fans picked up on that. Close, but different. While that satisfied the true fans, Star Trek was about to receive a fan request like no other. Well, everyone's very curious about you. It's how bet they are. We got a call from Whoopi Goldberg saying that she wanted to be considered to take Denise's role as the head of security. But with a chance to have a big Hollywood star in their show, they had other plans for Whoopi. Whoopi wasn't really the head of security type for us. And Gene and I sat down and we discussed it and thought, what a great idea to have a bartender. Gynam. Captain. But even as a humble bartender, Whoopi's mega star power was quietly saving Star Trek. With experience. A major movie star at the peak of her career decided to do this show. I think we became legit when Whoopi came on the show. It could have been your timing. My timing is digital. Others would soon be departing. 
I was very happy at the end of the year to say bye-bye. I would not have stayed for more. Can I ask why? No. I don't need to hear what you don't need to say. Star Trek's doctors were going down faster than their patients, and fans were clamoring for the return of Dr. Crusher. So that's where I come in, again. I was at Starfleet Medical for a year. I missed about two inches of him. It took some convincing, but when the captain calls... I got a call from Patrick. He asked me if I would please consider coming back. The return of Dr. Crusher was a bone crusher for head writer Maurice Hurley, who had previously said... Either she goes or I go. Maurice, at the end of the second season, he voluntarily left the show. One of the first things that happened at the beginning of the third season was, let's bring Gates back. And Diana was never spoken of again. But just as the ship began to steady on screen, Star Trek The Next Generation was forced to undergo a changing of the guard at the top. Gene realized that the day-to-day -day running of the show needed to be turned to the next generation, and that was Rick Berman. It happened slowly. He got less and less involved as his illness took over. Rick Berman was a studio executive who had a lot in common with Gene. You know, Gene felt he could trust him. Gene's optimistic attitude of the future, I always felt was somewhat unrealistic, but it was his attitude, and I felt it was my responsibility to keep Gene's optimism alive. But the long shadow of Star Trek's creator was putting the next generation in the shade. You'd have these very acrimonious fights with Rick about what Star Trek was. Gene would never do this in a million years, he would say. Rick was going to defend to his dying breath what he thought Gene wanted Star Trek to be. While Rick defended Gene's vision, there was one subject matter Gene was willing to explore that Rick wasn't. At some point, Gene mentions that we're going to have to have a gay crew member. And so, in an episode called Blood and Fire... There's a scene in Blood and Fire where someone turns to the gay crew member and says, how long have you and Freeman been together? That was it. Rick Berman wrote a memo we can't have gay characters on Star Trek because mommies will write letters. And I wrote a memo which says Gene promised gay crew members on this Enterprise, if not now, uh, when. One of the producers sticks his head in my office, says, great memo, you still have to take the characters out. David's groundbreaking script was lost to history. And with it went one of Star Trek's most faithful servants. That was the reason why I quit, because this is hypocrisy. Star Trek The Next Generation had been on a merry-go-round of casting chaos. Well, it's nice to be together again. The balance of power was shifting behind the scenes, too. It was a switch at the top of the writing staff. You know, Morris Hurley had left, and Michael Piller came in. Things really took a turn and seemed to start going in the right direction. Can it be possible they know what they're doing? Well, by the show's third year, maybe, yes. God bless Michael Piller. When he took the reins, he really understood the potential of the show and understood storytelling and science fiction. The show is not about the ship. This show is about Riker and Picard and the characters. It's about the people. But good characters need good stories. And halfway through season three, the only action the writer's room had seen was industrial. The writer's strike had just ended. There was not a full staff. There was a point where we had nothing. But one thing Star Trek still had was its fans. And Trekkers themselves were about to intervene in a way that would restore the show they loved and ultimately set a new direction. We invited absolute unknowns and newcomers to come in and pitch story ideas. If you wrote an actual script, you could send it to Paramount and somebody would read it. And if they thought it was good, they might give it to a producer. One fan script caught the attention of production assistant Eric Stilwell. Trent Ganino's script involved an enterprise from the past. That script didn't make it to screen. We had gone up to Trent's hometown for a Star Trek convention where Denise Crosby was the guest. We were speaking to her in the autograph line, and she said, you should write an episode and bring me back. Tasha. Yeah. But there was one small issue to do with her being, um, what's the word? Dead. That's it. You know, I died. We know that. Of course, everyone knew that. I'm not supposed to be here, sir. And so Trent and I together started hashing out, how can we bring Tasha back because she's dead? Well, there was one way. Time travel, of course. So Eric traveled across the hall. Yeah, I ran across the hall. Started just cold pitching. And Michael Piller said, Make it so. We'll give you a couple. But it was still a very basic idea. 
they turned it over to Ron Moore to polish the story. I took yesterday's Enterprise. I really liked the idea of the alternate timeline. And there was a mention of like they had been a war with the Klingons. But it wasn't front and center of the story. And I just thought, oh, that's the coolest part, is that they're at war. And oh, well, that would make it a darker universe. And like everything would be more warlike and militarized. What's the matter with the bridge? This is not a ship of war. This is a ship of peace. Now the story had become serious enough that Captain Picard had to whisper. The war is going very badly for the Federation. Hey, they're not just at war, but the Federation's actually losing. The good guys are losing, and it's all going to come crashing down. And that gave this episode this sense of stakes, and it made it a bit of a tragedy. You know, there's a doomed sense to the world that you were in. The Federation has lost more than half of Starfleet to the Klingons. And now with the fleshed out outline. And of course, I read it and went, this is fabulous. This is great. And I said, I'm on board. Where am I supposed to be? Dead. Producers now had their idea and the actress ready to play Lazarus. But days from shooting, there was still something missing. We had no script. Scrambling to put together an ambitious episode. There was just an outline of what the thing was. This was seven days before we shot. There was no time for any one writer to do a complete draft. We all wrote separately and then stitched them together. It's a real mess down here, sir. Everybody was convinced that it was just going to be this hodgepodge, horrible episode that they had thrown together at the last minute. What ship is this, Captain? They're aboard the Enterprise. In the rush, the writers managed to smuggle in some Star Trek firsts. Rachel Garrett, how's my ship? Rachel Garrett was breaking new ground as Star Trek's first female captain. In the script, it wasn't a woman. I remember thinking at the time, it's weird that I'm the one doing this. <laughs> it's like, how is this the first time this has been done? We'll make it one for the history books. I wanted her to be every bit as brave and heroic. She had to be worthy of Picard and Kirk. Captain, I would be lying to you if I told you there was a chance in hell of coming out of this alive. Captain Garrett broke through Star Trek's glass ceiling but unfortunately also broke her head. This is Lieutenant Yar, sir. Captain Garrett is dead. For the character of Tasha Yar, it was an unlikely win. Yesterday's Enterprise became a redeeming episode for Tasha's senseless death. A death without purpose. She even addresses this very thing. I'd like my death to count for something. I always make the joke, I had to die to get a good script. This isn't a joke, Tasha. Just as this fan-sourced episode reanimated Tasha Yar, it reinvigorated the next generation. Yesterday's Enterprise is a very risky episode that could have gone south a thousand different ways, but it worked. And a part of my crew. I am now. Captain Picard approved my request for transfer. It was the first, in my opinion, truly great episode of Next Generation. And I think it really raised the profile of Next Generation. I think people sat up, took note, and took the show more seriously. Welcome aboard. It seemed that Star Trek The Next Generation had finally found its place in the universe. Space, the final frontier. These are the voyages of the Starship Enterprise. With the steady hands of Michael Piller and Rick Berman steering the ship, Star Trek The Next Generation had successfully extended the franchise's mission. To boldly go where no one has gone before. But behind the scenes, personnel issues were only getting more personal. Mr. Crusher, report to the bridge. I had this terrific opportunity to go work in a feature film, and Rick Berman said, this is a really important Wesley episode. I have personally written an extremely important scene. It's a really important part of the show. Our hands are tied. He has to pass on the film. You're not involved in this decision, boy. After I had passed on the film and the film had been recast, he wrote me out of the episode completely, and I was furious. Look, I have done everything that everyone has asked of me and more. It hurt so much. And after that happened, I said to my agent, get me out of this contract, get me off the show. I don't want to work for this person anymore. It was another unwelcomed departure, but then came the news of an even more significant loss. It was during the fifth season of Star Trek Next Generation. Sorry to interrupt. We're receiving an emergency distress signal. I'm on my way. The producers received some news that would stop them in their tracks. Rick got a phone call. He took it and didn't say much, and then he came back and sat down with us and told us. And Gene, he passed away. 
and one of the most significant individuals ever to impact television was now gone. Gene Roddenberry died suddenly on October 24th, 1991, 25 years after the launch of Star Trek. His memorial service, it was a perfect send off to him. Hundreds and hundreds of people. They had the blue angels fly over at the end. A handful of people actually create something that lasts 55 years, you know. He managed to create this iconic thing that defines the best part of the 20th century, a vision of hope, a vision of what could be a way to ask questions about who we are and what we're up to in the world. But even still, Star Trek without Gene? It's heartbreaking. It was a, a big deal for the Star Trek family to, that he was gone. Without its creator, Star Trek The Next Generation continued for another two and a half years. The series wrapped with a two-part extravaganza that Gene no doubt would have been proud of. The series finale really brought us full circle to some of the issues and themes that were brought up in Encounter at Farpoint. It's time to put an end to your trek through the stars. I thought it was a sensational double episode at the end. Captain Picard? Yes. yes. There was nothing that I felt I could have asked for more than the way they explored where our characters go or have gone. The whole final episode was a love letter to the series and to the fans. It didn't feel right to just go up onto the bridge and press engage one more time. It was really about them and how much they loved each other. Yes, yes! We knew we wanted to end the show with a poker game. And the key was that Picard never joined the poker game. I, uh, I just thought that I might, um, I might join you this evening. So we wanted to gather the family together, just loving each other's company. I should have done this a long time ago. It's the last line gonna be. It had to be a poker line, you know, and I think it might have been Jerry Taylor who came up with it. And the sky's the limit. It was a very sad time for me, and a sad episode, just because it was over. It turned out to be one of the great episodes. Paramount's risky experiment and direct to syndication television had paid off. You've saved humanity once again. And not just commercially. 1994 was peak Trek. You have Next Generation ending with an Emmy nomination. But on the other side of every peak is a descent. And emboldened by its success, Star Trek was about to descend once more into chaos in deep space. This was the show that they aren't that pleased with. You're obviously a prisoner of Federation dogma and human prejudice. And ultimately, deep trouble. There were a lot of people who didn't like the way it was going, the fact that it was serialized. A lot of the audience gave up. Paramount just threw up their hands. 